Yes, uh, thanks for the introduction, Nadia. Um, this talk um, is, if, if you would give it a subtitle, it would be uh, What Can Go Wrong um, If Your VPN Supports Old Legacy Authentication Mechanisms? And uh, this is joint work with uh, Martin Grote and Jörg Schwenk from uh, your Ruhr University in Bochum in Germany and uh, Adam Chubak and Marcin Szymanek um, from the University of Apollo in Poland. So um, I probably don't uh, need to uh, introduce the term VPN to this audience. Um, I suppose you have heard uh, the term virtual private network before. Um, they're used in uh, a lot of situations. So for example, if a uh, student is connecting to a university network, they can use that uh, via tunnels so they can access the library, for example, or uh, members of a corporation can uh, use it to access some internal servers. Um, generally speaking, if uh, gateways are connecting to each other, um, and they require some uh, protection of their communication. They usually use those tunnels. And um, one newer um, thing that is that can be found in the uh, VPN world is with the 4G or LTE networks. Um, there are the links between the base stations and the core of the network. The so-called backhole links are um, secured using VPNs. And if you have a newer phone and your contract allows it, then also your smartphone, if you have the uh, voice over Wi-Fi functionality, then also your phone uses a VPN tunnel to your network provider um, using authentication with your SIM card. So there are a lot of VPNs on the internet which are probably not even obvious uh, to you while you're using them. So where can uh, IPsec be found in the, in the network layer? Um, it's on layer three, it's just above the IP layer. So it protects everything that is uh, being sent via TCP or UDP. Um, and it provides integrity, uh, authenticity, and uh, confidentiality. Um, of course, to provide such features, it's necessary to have a handshake protocol, and uh, the handshake protocol of IPsec is called IKE, Internet Key Exchange. Um, it exists in two versions. Um, the first one, IKE v1, has been published in 1998, so it's rather old. Um, nowadays, it's declared obsolete by the ITF, but it's nevertheless present in all the implementations. It's in every operating system and in all the gateways that are out there. Um, the newer version, IKE v2, is, has been published in 2005. It's the current version. There have been minor updates to it, but um, it's, uh, yeah, nothing of substance has changed in there. So how does um, IKE v1 look like? I'd like to focus now on, on the first version, on the old one. Um, IKE v1 is UDP-based. And um, on, the, on the protocol layer, if, if you look into the uh, application, it uh, looks like this. So uh, when I'm putting uh, here, um, you see that it's a six message protocol. The first pair of messages um, does some negotiation of cryptographic par parameters. Um, if you're familiar with TLS, that's like setting up cipher suites. So in the first phase, there are cryptographic algorithms exchanged and um, validity periods, uh, how long tunnels may be established. Um, the second pair of messages um, is a, basically a Diffie-Hellman key exchange. It's a key agreement, um, and there is also a part of the authentication in the second pair of messages. And the third pair um, does a confirmation of that keys, um, similar to uh, TLS finish messages. So let's take a deeper look into the protocol itself. The protocol flow, um, first of all, I have to, I have to say that um, in the uh, Ike world, we're talking about initiators and responders and not about clients and servers. The protocol is quite symmetric, so there is no clear role of somebody being a client or somebody being a server. You just have to differentiate between who is initiating and who is responding. So in the first message, um, I'll put that away. In the first message, um, there are pro is a set of proposals, so cryptographic parameters that uh, the initiator proposes. And with the second message, the responder chooses one of those. In the third message, there is a G to the X, so as I said, it's a Diffie-Hellman key exchange, and some ancillary data, we'll come to that later. With the fourth method, uh, the Diffie-Hellman key exchange is completed. After that, both sides can derive keys, compute max for um, yeah, authenticity, and uh, that things are uh, correct. Then the uh, these Macs are encrypted using keys that have been derived before, and with message five and six, those values are exchanged and verified by both sides. After that, the keys are authenticated. So as I said, I'll come back to this uh, ancillary, ancillary data. Um, this ancillary data is used for authentication. 
Um, in Ike v1, there are different authentication methods, and uh, to give it a better frame, I'll just put this here. So we're looking at the second two pairs of messages um, in the Ike v1 handshake. So there are four authentication methods in Ike v1. The first one with pre-shared keys, usually that's some kind of password, so both sides of the tunnel need to have the same password, and then they can use that. The second method uses digital signatures. And the third and the fourth option use public key encryption. Um, the fourth method is called revised mode. Um, I'll not go into the details what this revision means. Um, the modes are very similar to each other. Um, here, um, so for, the, for public key encryption based modes, um, you basically need to have key pairs and they are required to be exchanged securely beforehand. So it's a out of band public key exchange. Yes. So um, I'd like to focus on the um, third method here, on the public key encryption mode. Public key encryption in IQV1 basically means RSA. Uh, it's from 1998. They had nothing uh, fancy other than RSA for public key. Um, so let's go back to this uh, protocol flow. What happens if we plug in um, PKE authentication? That basically changes messages three and four. Here, the ancillary data is now replaced by or filled in with an encryption of a nonce. There are these nonces NI and NR, which are randomly chosen nonces by both sides, and they're encrypted using the public key of the peer and sent over. Um, these nonces are later used in the key derivation, and the capability to decrypt these nonces implicitly authenticates a peer then. So you may now ask, um, how does such a encryption look like? Um, if we take a look into the RFC, it's uh, RFC 2409. There is one single sentence that lines that out. RSA encryption must be encoded in PKCS1 format. PKCS1 is uh, even older than IKE. And uh, if you're familiar with cryptographic attacks, then you probably know that PKCS1 is exactly the, um, what you need to apply so-called Bleichenbacher attacks. Um, so we ask ourselves, what could go wrong uh, in PKC as one format in such a protocol, what if there were Bleichenbacher oracles? Um, I assume that not everyone here is uh, familiar with Bleichenbacher attacks, so I'll just give a, two, a short primer in two slides. Um, if you're interested in more Bleichenbacher, there is another talk uh, this afternoon um, given by my colleague Jura Somorowski um, on the robot study, which is a recent Pony Award winner, so make sure to join that talk as well. Um, Bleichenbacher's attack is a padding oracle attack. Um, it's against RSA PKC as one version 1.5, so that's a long acronym, but the padding is rather simple. The first two bytes of uh, such a method, um, message have to look like this. You have a uh, beginning with a 0, 0, 0, 0002. Then there is a random non-zero padding, a single zero byte that delimits between padding and the message. And here in this case, uh, the, the message is a nonce. And for, for attacking this, you require an oracle that tells you whether the padding is valid or not. So it's a single bit of information that you have to get back from such an oracle. So how does an oracle look like, or what, what is a, an attack scenario? Um, it looks like this. You have a sender and a receiver, and the sender sends a message M to the receiver, and somehow the attacker is capable of eavesdropping that message but it's encrypted, the attacker cannot do anything about it. But what the attacker can do is leverage some mathematical properties of RSA to modify the message and send it also to the receiver. And let's assume the receiver is such an oracle, then the attacker gets back the single bit information whether the padding was valid or not. And with this information, the attacker can do some computations and by repeating this approach, by continuously modifying messages and sending it to the responder, and getting a information back whether the padding was valid or not, in the end, the attacker learns the plain text of the message M. That requires a couple of thousand messages to that oracle, but um, it works. So if we combine this attack approach with IKE, how would an attack scenario look like? Um, we require a man-in-the-middle attacker here, and we have two responders, responder A and responder B, and the attacker being right in the middle. In the beginning, the attacker simply follows the protocol and establishes a handshake with responder A. And in the, he adheres to the protocol, he does not modify anything. 
um, what not modify, but he, he does a simple handshake. And with the fourth method, uh, message, the, uh, the attacker learns the encryption of the random nonce that responder A chose. Of course, the attacker cannot decrypt it because it's encrypted with a public key of responder B. But what the attacker can now do is he can do a Bleichenbacher attack against the other responder that the, the, the message was intended to be for. <coughs> While doing that, he has to keep the other responder waiting because if he would just cancel the handshake, then responder A would discard all the ephemeral values, um, namely the uh, Diffie-Hellman um, secrets, so then the attacker would not gain anything by learning the nonce in the end. So responder A has to be, uh, be held waiting. After the Bleichenbach attack is completed, um, the attacker learns the nonce, can derive all the keys, as the legitimate um, responder could do, and then finish the handshake with mess messages five and six, and impersonates responder B in this scenario. And then authentication is, of course, broken. Um, if you're familiar with IKE or with uh, implementations, then you're probably surprised about this uh, PKE authentication mode, because usually it's not implemented. Um, we've looked into all the open source implementation. None of the open source implementations um, have it in there. It's described in the RFC, but in open source software, it's not implemented. Um, but there are a few implementations of this. Um, most prominent, uh, Cisco and Huawei implemented. So PKE authentication is contained in Cisco iOS. And the revised mode is also contained in, uh, in Huawei, uh, in, in some Huawei firewalls. Um, but they only have the revised mode. They have not the uh, original one. And we also find out, uh, found out that uh, there are uh, implementations by some Swedish uh, corporation named Clavista and uh, the Taiwanese company Zyxel. Um, they have uh, security gateways that implement, uh, not implement, they have a broken implementation. They don't support this mode officially. There is no config option for it. It's not working. You can't configure pure public keys. But PKE messages are processed far enough to exploit them. Well, um, so we, uh, yeah, to test that, we uh, made sure that we get some test devices. Um, basically, we went to eBay and bought these things. For Cisco, we were lucky uh, to get one test device. So this is how it looks uh, in our network lab. And um, for this talk here, um, I would like to focus on, on Cisco iOS now as a case study. Um, why Cisco? Well, because I don't have the time to talk about all the oracles there and all the implementations. And uh, in Cisco, it's at least officially supported, um, and it has fewer bugs than the Huawei implementation. Um, our test device is a uh, ASR 1001X router with uh, that iOS version. Um, so how does the oracle look like? Um, in the beginning, when you're doing a handshake with this uh, Cisco iOS device, then uh, with the first two messages, uh, proposals are chosen, uh, nothing fancy here. But if you then send a message three with a valid padding, then of course, what happens with the protocol, uh, the, the device follows the protocol, so it sends you message four. Um, but if you send an invalid padding, then the device waits a second and then responds with message, uh, message two. So, uh, putting a frame here on it. The difference is, in one case, you get back message four. In the other case, you get back message two. And that's exactly the single bit information we need for a Bleichenbacher Oracle attack, because we now know, was the device able of decrypting it or not? So there are other ob uh, obstacles um, in exploiting this. Um, as I said, one responder has to be held waiting. And for Cisco iOS, that's not that easy because after 60 seconds, um, a handshake is simply discarded. Um, we didn't find any way of uh, having a longer time frame than 60 seconds. Um, and when we're configuring a 10, 24 bit key, then our device is capable of doing about 850 cryptographic computations per second. Um, I'm foc focusing, there, there's responses on the slide. It's basically cryptographic computations. Um, that means um, if we send, um, if we have these uh, 60 seconds of time, then we have to finish the attack in 51,000 requests. Um, 
because our device was quite slow, we simulated um, how an attack would look like. We uh, implemented an Oracle that behaves exactly like the Cisco one and also exactly like the Clavister and Zuxel ones. They have the same properties. Um, and we found out that about a quarter of attacks um, would work um, in this scenario. Um, yes, but um, there were other obstacles with uh, Cisco that um, prevented a successful exploitation. Um, first of all, Cisco's I, uh, IKE handshake implementation is not optimized for throughput. And uh, the cryptographic calculations uh, for IKE are done by the CPU. Um, despite it having a hardware accelerator for cryptography, and the state machine is single-threaded, so uh, yeah, the, that was a problem that we encountered. And what we didn't suspect is that the first two messages with Cisco IOS really take a long time. Uh, we don't know exactly why, um, but uh, the majority of time is being taken uh, by the first two messages, which are absolutely non-cryptographic. Um, so these were purely non-cryptographic obstacles that we had there. So in one case, um, we had a decryption attack that had re uh, required 19,000 requests, but uh, unfortunately it took us uh, 13 minutes, so we couldn't in the end uh, man in the middle of the connection, but I think we're quite near to it. So is an attack realistic? Well, first of all, a too, slack, a too slow attack does not permanently lock out an attacker. Uh, they can simply start over hoping that their next, uh, their next attempt requires fewer requests. And it is still dangerous if your uh, installation has multiple devices that uh, share the same key pair, for example, when you're doing load balancing. Um, so these are the CVE numbers um, for the implementations we analyzed. Um, Cisco is only one example. We found uh, the other three ones. Um, and yeah, patches are available. Um, interestingly, we did not find any uh, RPKE uh, implementation or PKE implementation out there that did not contain a Bleichenbacher Oracle. So all that implemented it were vulnerable. So the paper title is about key reuse. So I um, would like to point out uh, a little thing about key reuse as well. So usually when configuring um, IKE, administrators do not um, maintain individual key pairs for all variants of IKE. Um, the common practice is to have a single RSA key pair. Um, not even for IKE, sometimes even for more things like with Huawei, um, they also use their device's RSA key pair, uh, RSA key pair for SSH uh, host identification as well. So the actual security of the whole thing depends on cross cipher suite and cross version and cross protocol security. And one thing, I don't know if, if you're aware of this, but um, you're certainly aware that in, for RSA, decryption and creating a, signature, uh, creating a signature is the same operation. So Bleichenbacher attacks can forge signatures, which is also being presented in the uh, robot uh, study this afternoon. So um, once we have that tool at hand, we can think about, can we attack other protocols like IKE v2 with signatures? And we found out, yes, this is possible. Um, signatures are supported by both IKE v1 and IKE v2. And on a Cisco router, um, we have more time for that. In IKE v2, we have four minutes time for an attack. But creating signatures using RSA um, Bleichenbacher attacks takes, um, takes more time. So in the end, we turned out to have a succeeding rate of about 22% with a simulator. Again, the real hardware lacks the performance with the first two messages. Yes. So we have, a, we have some other contributions in the paper as well. There is a description of a, uh, an attack against uh, uh, password-based password -based authentication in main mode. We have uh, message flow diagrams of all the IKE variants in the paper. Um, there is a description of all the other uh, implementations and their oracles. And uh, we also have a description of the uh, parallelized Bleichenbacher attack tool we implemented for this. Um, so, with that, uh, I conclude my talk, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. Hello, uh, Jeffrey Goldberg from Agile Bits. Uh, 
I'm wondering, have you spoken to anyone at Oracle about that delay on those first two messages and at the tinfoil hat end of speculation, uh, whether that was sort of like just a dirty hack to maintain compatibility while trying to thwart attacks of this nature? Again, wild speculation, but it might be interesting to know why that delay is there. Um, first of all, we we have not uh, asked Cisco or the other vendors. I mean, it's, it's a Cisco only uh, problem. Um, we have not uh, asked them about what is the problem there. Yeah, the only speculation I can give is uh, that it's probably because of this, that very old software. Um, we had a comment from one of the Cisco developers who said, well, um, this has been developed ages ago and probably has never been uh, updated since then. Um, because nowadays, Cisco routers have multi-core CPUs, but the thing is still single-threaded. So if they would care for uh, performance, then they would have rewritten the code to be multi-threaded. Um, and uh, when we were, um, a little, little side note, when we were playing around with it, uh, we found out um, that they even don't uh, comply to the standard they develop themselves. Um, there is a, a little bug with the um, with header offsets. And uh, so when we asked them about this and, and told them you're, you're incompatible to the standard, they said, well, there have probably never been interoperability, uh, interoperability tests with other devices probably because no other device implements it. And Cisco devices among each other, they work pretty well because both have the bug. So you mentioned key reuse between SSH and IPsec. Um, did you observe any key reuse between with a, a TLS interfaces at all? Did you do any measurements? Um, I've, I've looked at this. Um, in one case, I thought it was the case, but it turned out to be an error that I had made. So um, with uh, Huawei, um, their TLS key for the web interface seems to be hard baked into the firmware. So if one is capable of decrypting their firmware package, that's probably another issue. But um, yeah, we, we didn't test for that. So I, I, I'm not aware of a, a device that um, uses the Ike keys for TLS, but you can configure it that way. For example, with Clevister, uh, when you're setting up IKE and you really don't care for security, you, you, you get a um, drop-down menu where you can select the key to use for, uh, for IKE. And the only key that is there if you use a, a, comp a fresh installation of their device, the only available key is the one that is used for the TLS web interface. So if an admin really doesn't care, you just select that one and uh, then, yeah, then you have the situation. Wait, so they have a hard-coded key for the web interface, uh, but they're generating, but you, you can generate a fresh key for? Uh, for, for, for Huawei, you can. You for can. Huawei, you can. But the default key is it's hard-baked, as far as I know. Um, and for, for Clavista, the case is that um, on initial booting um, of, of their OS image, a fresh key is generated for the web interface, but it's available in the selection for the IKE keys. So what's kind of interesting, just anecdotally, we see the same vendors over and over again with every attack paper on public key crypto. So I'm recognizing the same vendors from uh, mining your P's and Q's uh, six years ago, and I'm also re recognizing some of the same vendors from the drown attack. So it's kind of over and over again we see the same names. And there, there might be some you know, completely cross-vulnerability uh, <laughs> cross attacks there. Would be interesting to analyze that, yes. Jared Jacobson, L3 Technologies. Um, did you have to take any steps to enable the PKE functionality in the negotiation on any of these devices, or did they come secure by default and that it wasn't enabled? For Cisco and Huawei, they come secure by default, so it's not enabled um, by default. Um, with uh, Clavister and Zuxel, um, the other situation is different. Um, you have to enable um, IKE or IPsec if you want to use it, but when you do that check mark for enabling it, then those devices were vulnerable because there, there's no configuration option for PKE. You can disable it, and you can only disable the whole IPsec, uh, IPsec thing in that router, um, but then you lose the, the overall functionality. Of course, you can uh, install the patch, then it's gone. So Clavister and Zuxel simply removed that, uh, yeah, that bug uh, from their firmware. Yeah. 
It's actually one more question. Um, I mean, Blackenbacher attacks have been around forever, and you know, the TLS spec, even though they didn't actually properly protect against them, they at least mentioned them. Was there any discussion in the standards for Ike about Blackenbacher attacks or any attempt to protect against them? Uh, hmm? uh, he said 1998, so there was no update or no mention, uh, no. Yeah, so in, uh, I don't know if I forgot to mention that in IKE v2, um, there is no public key encryption mode anymore. They, remo they removed that. Okay. So getting rid of RSA entirely is a good protection. <laughs> That's what they not did with IKE v2. <laughs> so for signatures, it's still there. Okay. Uh, I think we're at time if there's no more questions, so 